Hi guys and welcome to Graphic APRS Modem Video Part 5 and the purpose of this one is uh, to catch you up basically there's not a lot to see here um, but by the time it comes to showing you what I wanted to show you basically uh, that I didn't show you when I built the last one because I kept actually adding features in software after I stopped making videos when it comes to that that's best off happening out somewhere in the bush, high up on a mountain, where I'll receive a lot of APRS packets, which is not something that's easy to happen here. Uh, at the time when I was working on this, uh, 2020 and 2021, uh, I had hardware that I simply don't have now. Um, I had a, a J-Pole antenna on the roof, and now my best radio is a handheld um, Yaesu FT818 with a, a little diamond antenna which would get packets and decode packets here. Um, but what I want to show you is, is best off where it actually receives a lot of data and decodes a lot of data, which was happening uh, in 2020 and 2021, uh, when I had a fairly ideal setup here for two meter VHF. Um, so yeah, so I guess I want a demarcation. I want everything uh, to, to basically be working um, I have got the GPS now, as you'll see, to connect to this thing, and um, I'm ordering a radio. Well, I have ordered a radio. I'm waiting for a Vertex Standard VX2200, which I have used before um, on this same, well, not this hardware, uh, <laughs> not this instance of hardware, but in uh, probably 2021, I had one of these radios. I had two, actually, and it did work well um, with the APRS modem. And when I got sick of the whole thing, I sold both of them. Um, I'm actually quite over amateur radio altogether. I don't have a microphone at the moment. It's not a negative thing, but in, in my mind, it's overrated. It's kind of as someone who's mic shy and doesn't really get off on communicating with strangers all around the world. Um, in addition to that, there's not much else for me other than experimentation with hardware and appreciation of the, the even the consumer radios that are made by companies for us so i do have an appreciation for the hardware um other than that it's touted as uh, an emergency backup and all that and i think that's quite well overrated is the word um yes it could serve a purpose but um it, it's not one i'm really too fussed on this is the fourth uh, garmin gps 18 series that i've purchased in my lifetime uh, they come in different connection varieties. This one they just call the bare wire version. Um, it's got a micro JST connector that they say they use for testing, um, but you're supposed to cut that off. Um, five meters of cable, don't think I'll be needing all of that. This will be default. 4800 board it can be configured so I've adjusted my software to use the default 4800 board as I did in my vehicle which also uses one of these as I've mentioned um, so yeah it would remember my configuration for 9600 board until something went wrong with the battery uh, so I think I'd rather just um, connect this up with three wires just the power and receive and never have to make an adjustment to this Things aren't always as simple as you want them to be, are they? So um, in order to facilitate the connection uh, directly to potentially an RS-232 serial port on a computer, uh, Garmin inverts its uh, serial line electrically. So when it's idle, it's low. Whereas normally a TTL level thing on a board um, would be normally high. Uh, so since it's inverted on the hardware side, a change had to be made. I've added the GPS serial port here and there's um, just the supply. It's really close to power supply. This purple wire, the only violet wire on the board, uh, runs from this plug underneath this chip back out up to a spare uh, inverter gate and then back out to the DS pick where it connects to where the old U-Blocks module did. So that's all that's really got to happen is, um, so it didn't cost any more components, but a tiny bit of extra work. Now, on the software side, here we have uh, a typical GPR MC sentence, which is, yeah, 
most pertinent uh, sent in NMEA sentence you'll get out of a, a GPS. Um, and this one compares the UBlox module output to the Garmin one beneath. So you here, go across here, uh, we have the time, just an imaginary one. And then already we've got a, a difference between the two where the UBlox module has uh, a decimal, well that'd be centiseconds, uh, whereas the Garmin just has seconds. So um, a decent GPS parser would pull all this information out by searching the string for commas. Um, so it would count commas to get up to a, a field where you wanted the information. So if it's time, you'd just look for a comma. Well, first of all, you'd uh, check the checksum all the way. You'd just scan, uh, calculate all the way to here and check that the checksum was accurate. Uh, then uh, you'd count commas. So if you wanted the time, you'd count one comma and then read this in. Um, you'd understand the format and you'd be able to read this into integers if you had a something with the decimal point. Um, you'd look either side of the decimal point and add or divide by 10 and write all that into a float. Um, that's if you wrote a decent parser, but if you're like me and you wanted to save memory, you'd be lazy and just read all this into a buffer uh, from zero to whatever, however much memory you had. Check the checksum, which I did, and then from there you'd be lazy and assume you had always had a U-Box GPS and if you wanted to check, say, whether this uh, sentence was a valid position, you'd check for this A, which is a hex um, 41. And you'd only have to check um, for the 17th element of the array and check whether that's an A. Uh, but then when you go and add a different GPS, you find something else and you haven't got a position fix ever. Um, so there was some change to be made because the A is over here and that obviously offsets everything else. Another thing you'll notice, um, there is more precision in the U blocks um, there's uh, one more number, one more decimal digit after your uh, latitude here. Um, yeah, but it, just one uh, difference would offset everything, so there are some adjustments to be made. Um, I can understand why I did it the simple way. It saves memory, and also the U-Box GPS was a surface mount module that's part of the circuit board, which you wouldn't expect to be removed and replaced. So it made sense then. Uh, when you have a removable GPS on this one, uh, it's more of a, a theoretical reason to support multiple GPS units, as would naturally happen if you were passing this the proper way. Whether I will or not, I don't know, because um, memory was uh, really uh, getting really low by the time I was finishing working on this, so I don't really want to do anything to expand it. With all that in place, the thing can be expected to work. Not much of a climax here because it's tested and I'm really only testing one wire in addition to last time. And there you go. Man, I love that. That's talking myself up, isn't it? Um, when we get a, a nice position fix and all the um, astronomy information starts uh, scrolling across the screen, uh, the unit will test the TNC chip. Uh, we'll set it up, it will write some information to it, and in addition to this test, there's another way that the unit can be tested with regard to that information. I'll just let it go here. APGDT0 is, is like the call sign for software and before Bob Reninga passed away in early 2022 uh, he assigned that to me. Um, this data will never come, I need a radio for that, but in the next segment I will uh, show you uh, the next stage of testing that can be done uh, to test communication between the TNC chip and uh, my DSPIC. So Bob Ball's original terminal node controller project. Uh, it was just two chips. It's the PIC16 F88 and a MAX232 uh, RS232 level converter for 
uh, plugging into a computer of the era. When it was connected to a GPS, it was a simple tracker that just uh, transmitted the GPS sentence and uh, the receivers knew to interpret that as a position. If it was plugged into a computer through a serial port, it provided a serial command line interpreter so it could be used as a, a very manual um, packet modem working with very raw data uh, requiring a lot of work for the user because if you wanted to comply with the IPRS um, protocol for example you'd have to type out a very uh, full and complete packet. Um, it could also operate as a converse server for example which has nothing to do with APRS. APRS isn't even supported on this chip at all, it's an AX25 modem. Um, the APRS support would be up to you, the user, in your typing. Um, anyway, the reason I, I bring this up is uh, my circuit still does have this MAX232. So for my project, the MAX232 is still here and it's used for testing uh, the TNC chip as it's being made. Um, it doesn't serve a purpose in everyday use because uh, the DSPIC and the 16F88 can communicate with each other directly uh, through serial lines. Whenever the 5 volt PIC is connected to the 3 volt PIC, uh, it uses a 5 volt tolerant line if it's an output going into the DSPIC. Same with the GPS. Uh, that's a TTL level and I'm using a 5 volt tolerant line. Well, it's actually coming from this inverter now, as I told you before. But one reason to leave the MAX232 here is uh, it can be used as a debug output so I can actually connect it to a serial terminal still and see the communication between these two chips. Uh, potentially it could be used, uh, it could be doing its thing with handling remote control and whatnot and still be connected to another program on a Windows computer, so like Pinpoint for example if you wanted to see position on a map which this doesn't support. Um, so you could get the functionality of both uh, because this then could be acting like your KISS terminal. Um, but what we can see if this is plugged into a computer now is we can check that this chip is configuring this chip at power up. Um, it happens after the GPS position fix that you saw before. Um, then this chip will configure this in the way that a human was supposed to through a serial uh, command line interpreter. Um, this chip has to tell this chip the call sign and some other stuff and also every time a packet's being sent out um, it's assembled by this chip which does handle APRS protocol but it doesn't actually send it out um, through AFSK out, out to the radio so everything this does has to be sent to this chip first and we can watch that communication and that's a, a nice way to test things. ThinkPad awesomeness. We've got a serial terminal here, uh, TerraTerm a USB converter, um, which is also inclusive of a built-in RS-232 level converter, and then that's connected to the device as well as the GPS, and I'm going to power the device from the laptop's USB this time. Um, the GPS fix should happen quicker, because we've just done one, and we'll see a bunch of stuff on the serial terminal I might try and explain. Get in there. There we go. So yeah, we have got to fix quite quickly. But I'll stick to the terminal screen because that's what's um, of interest. Sorry about the camera shake. Here we go. This says OK. Yeah, once this exchange has happened. Digi-off, that means digipeter off because the, the ship can be a digipeter on its own uh, and then do nothing else. You have your path there, AP graphics data terminal zero, uh, wide one one, um, 
the call sign at the moment, VK4JJY. I took that from a friend who passed away. Um, terminal started. Um, don't know what, that's just your, um, that's what your packet text body would actually be. Uh, how often to beacon? Uh, never, because that's triggered by the DSPIC. Monitor all means um, uh, output every packet that comes in. And TX delay is your push to talk delay uh, to allow the radio's transmitter to stabilize before sending any data. And um, yeah, that's a little test. I can actually push a button here to go back to the clock. There was something I was going to explain in a previous video of why the form factor this time when the, the previous version was a, a box or it's a stack of two circuit boards with a screen on the front that you could build a box around and it would be something that sits on a desk. Uh, this one's a flat uh, one circuit board with uh, a screen angle and an L shape. wasn't uh, going to be like that. So this my Yesu FT818 and the, the new board that I've started using which I really like, they don't warp uh, when you start soldering to them happens to be an extremely uh, good or well, close to fit to the Yesu FT818 and the idea I had when uh, putting this together this time was, well that's my only radio, I'm going to connect it to this and there's a, a cage type thing you can buy called Portable Zero for stacking two of these together uh, for satellite work to make a full duplex rig because this is only uh, mono band. Um, I could have made something that uh, is mounted in place of the second FD818. Um, I didn't like it in the end because I, I have forethought now about this and I knew I'd be sick of it and wouldn't care for it. I didn't like that it covered the speaker, or well, the only way to put it on top would be to cover the speaker. If you put it underneath, um, the GPS isn't on top, so it, it, there's no way to sit on a desk nicely. Um, but yeah, the, the idea was also to have the LCD flat up here, but I actually backed myself into a corner as I was working and the LCD uh, connector ended up right in the top left corner with the LCD offset. So um, when I do make a uh, a cable for it, it'll probably be more centered and I don't really know <laughs> how it ends up looking to be honest. <laughs> um, that radio is on its way as we speak, um, it's paid for, but that's not the end. Uh, it needs an antenna, I don't know if the world needs a video about how to make a J-pole. Um, I am pretty good at it, I've done a few and they've all measured up uh, resonant where I wanted them. Um, and the radio needs a programmer. There's um, only one frequency I'm interested in, but the radio can't be uh, programmed or set to a frequency through its own interface. Um, so that's another circuit. Um, so uh, until uh, next time, catch us later.